World War II generated some of the most amazing spy stories of the 20th century. Deceit, betrayal, double crosses. These spies have seen everything, and then some. So, today we're blowing the whistle on the wildest World War II spy stories you'll ever hear. But before we uncover these moles, why don't you uncover that subscribe button? Then make your way to the comments and let us know what other spies you want to know about. For now, I spy with my little eye some weird history. His real name may have been Forrest Frederick Edward Yo Thomas, but you can call him Rabbit, White Rabbit. FFE Yo Thomas, the espionage agent with the Matrixy nickname, mostly took pictures of top secret documents behind embassy doors in the wee hours of the morning. After serving two years in the UK Royal Air Force, Yo Thomas decided his missions weren't dangerous enough and requested to be sent to occupied France, where he would serve as a liaison between the French government in exile and the resistance. Yo Thomas's first two missions went off without a hitch, but during the third, he was betrayed to and captured by the Gestapo. Our hero attempted numerous escapes until he was transferred to Buchenwald concentration camp in Germany, where he survived eight months of abuse before finally escaping from a work detail. In the process, Yo Thomas led many other POWs to freedom during the last days of the war. Beyond being considered one of the best British spies, Yo Thomas's legacy is cemented by pop culture. Author Ian Fleming was said to have based James Bond on him. In 1930, 22-year-old Krystyna Skarbek was a Miss Poland contest runner-up on her second marriage to writer and politician Jerzy Gizzyski. Then, nine years later, Germany invaded Poland, and everything changed. The couple headed for London, where Skarbek ended up working for British intelligence. After establishing a courier system from Poland to Hungary, the fluent French speaker took to France in 1944 under the assumed name Christine Granville. Under this new nom de guerre, Skarbek found herself navigating several intelligence operations. Her most famous jaunt was in Dinya where she tricked the Gestapo into releasing two captured agents, while her wanted poster was hanging throughout German headquarters. Even for the Nazis, that's embarrassing. Despite being awarded service medals from France and the UK, Skarbek was cut loose from the British government after the war. She was not permitted to return to communist Poland, and her life slowly spiraled out of control. She ended up living in a cruise ship hotel in 1952, where she was the victim of foul play by rejected suitor Dennis Muldowney. In 1935, Wilhelm Canadas thought Adolf Hitler was the bee's knees. He was even appointed the head of the Abwehr, Germany's military intelligence. Then Canaris got a front row seat to Hitler's World War II atrocities and changed his tune real fast. To right these many wrongs, Canaris started to collect like-minded opponents in the Abwehr and the military. He participated in several plots to eliminate the Fuhrer making sure to distance himself enough from the plan so he wouldn't be implicated. In 1944, another failed plot on Hitler's life took place, and the Fuhrer did away with the Abwehr entirely. This time, Canaris's luck ran out, and he was tattled on by others who were tortured for the information. Canaris went to prison, but refused to admit guilt until early April 1945, when his incriminating diaries were discovered. So Canaris and his co-conspirators were rounded up and hanged at Flossenburg concentration camp on April 9th, 1945. Nazis reading someone's private diary. Is there any low they won't stoop to? Odette Allos was born in France in 1912, moving to Britain after marrying an Englishman in 1931. 11 years later, based on the strength of some of her wartime photographs, Odette was recruited into British espionage outfit, the Special Operatives Executive. Allos was arrested by the Gestapo in 1943 and was subjected to torture at the notorious Crenn prison near Paris. Throughout multiple interrogations, Allos refused to reveal the whereabouts of other agents in the field, so she was given an all-expenses-paid trip to Ravensbrück concentration camp. After months of beatings and isolation, Allos spun a tale about her relation to Winston Churchill, telling her captors that her co-spy, Captain Peter Churchill, was Winston's nephew and that she was his wife, making her the English Prime Minister's niece-in-law. SS officer Fritz Zurin, the guy who ran the camp, 
bought the story hook, line, and sinker, and decided this was his out from the Nazi party. He drove Alos personally to the American lines to drop her off and surrender, hoping her status would save him from the consequences of his actions. It did not. Alos ended up testifying against Zurin and anyone else who made her life hell in Ravensbrück. For her actions, Alos became the first woman to receive the George Cross for acts of the greatest heroism or of the most conspicuous courage in circumstances of extreme danger. The husband and wife team of Haro and Libertas Schulze-Boysen hated the Third Reich. Both came from upper-class German backgrounds, with Haro being the son of a decorated naval officer and Libertas being the daughter of German nobility. These family connections allowed Haro to secure a position in the Reich Air Ministry in 1934. And once they had an in, they began forming a squad of like-minded anti-Nazis. As the 1940s approached, their private opposition quickly graduated to legitimate espionage, with large amounts of intel passing between them, the Soviets, and the U.S. government. This prompted the nickname the Red Orchestra, named because of how they would sing to Soviet Russia. Libertas would use her position in the German film industry to document evidence of German war crimes and pass it on via radio. But in 1942, one operative broadcast from the same place twice, which led to the Gestapo being able to locate and arrest the group, decoding messages to figure out who else was involved. The Gestapo spent the rest of that summer hunting down all the members of the resistance cell they could, eventually arresting Haro at the Air Ministry on August 31, 1942. And three days before Christmas, all captured members of the Schulze Boysen Espionage Club were eliminated. Aside from inspiring the Best Picture winner, the Manhattan Project made a lot of people nervous back in 1944. This was what kicked off Operation Magpie, the Reich's attempt to find out everything they could about the progress of the project. The plan was simple use a submarine to offload spies Eric Gimpel and William Kolpaw near the American town of Hancock, Maine. Did we say simple? We meant really weird. After landing in snowy Maine, the pair of spies made it to New York within two days, which is honestly impressive. They were given $60,000 for their mission, equivalent to about 650,000 smackaroos today, which allowed them to rent an apartment in Manhattan, probably a studio with no storage space. As is always a great undoer of mankind, Green reared its ugly head and ruined the plan for both men. Kolpaw stole most of the cash and went on a drunken bender. That ended up outing both spies and getting them arrested by December 30th. The two received death sentences. But since President Franklin D. Roosevelt wasn't the biggest fan of capital punishment, the sentences were commuted. Morris Moe Berg was a baseball player and coach from 1923 to 1939. Aside from being a baller, Berg was highly intelligent and multilingual, accompanying teams and players to Japan for a tour and exhibition game. On one 1934 trip, Berg filmed Tokyo and its harbor from a rooftop. By the time World War II broke out, Berg had a law degree and was involved in various counterintelligence efforts, eventually providing his film footage of Tokyo to the U.S. Army unit that planned the 1942 Doolittle Raid, but not the one where animals talk. Berg was then parachuted into enemy territory in Yugoslavia to find a way to deter German progress of atomic weapons. To accomplish this, Berg placed all his focus on German physicist Werner Heisenberg, you know, the one who knocks. In fact, Berg was set to eliminate Heisenberg while he was delivering a lecture. With a concealed pistol in his pocket and a cyanide pill in his possession, Berg watched the lecture and determined that Heisenberg had not yet developed any weapon, and the assassination was put on hold. Talk about leaving things until the last minute. After the war ended, Berg was awarded and declined the Presidential Medal of Freedom, since he wasn't exactly at liberty to share the secret of why he deserved it. After his intelligence contract expired in the 50s, Berg spent the next 20 years with friends and relatives, remaining coy about whether or not he was still working on top secret missions. He passed away in 1972 at the age of 70 and was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor, which was donated to the Baseball Hall of Fame. Albanian national Eliasa Bosna was hired as a valet by the British ambassador to Turkey. And his new boss, the stereotypically British named Sir Hugh Natchbull Hugeson, was notorious for bringing home sensitive classified documents. With his new codenamed Cicero, 
Bas now made some cash on the side by photographing and selling these top-secret documents to Germany throughout 1944. This side hustle brought in some serious scratch, too, with Bosna earning the highest amount ever paid to a spy up until that point. Eventually, the specific details of the leaks had all signs pointing to the Ankara Embassy as the source. While they had Bosna seemingly dead to rights, he was able to narrowly avoid detection during the war. After the war, Bosna learned the hard way about selling secrets to the Reich, when any new business ventures failed due to counterfeit payments from the Germans. He tried suing the government for what he was owed, but when that failed, he spent the rest of his days as a night watchman. Londoner Harold Coe had a real roller coaster of a career, starting off a villain before becoming a hero, only to end his tale as a villain again. Huh, like a quote from a Batman movie. Cole was a former convict who enlisted in the British Army after his release. In an irony to end all ironies, Cole again found himself prisoner after being captured during the German invasion of France in 1940. He was able to escape his imprisonment and hide out in Marseille, and worked to help his fellow soldiers by establishing escape lines with the French resistance. With Cole's help, several individuals were able to escape occupied France for a better life. Score one for Cole. Cole was captured yet again. But this time, the Gestapo was able to flip him to become an informer, no longer working for the French resistance, but directly against them. Fifty of the captured resistance fighters were executed by the Germans as a result. Eh, okay, I guess we have to take that point away from him. After the war, the British and French were understandably annoyed with Cole, and set out to hunt him down. He was captured and placed in a NATO prison in Paris, only to escape again in November of 1945. French police eventually found him on January 8, 1946, and eliminated him. He now rests in an unmarked pauper's grave. War is truly hell, even for spies like us. So what do you think? Which of these true-life tales of espionage surprised you the most? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from Our Weird History.